our doors opened in 1874 with a simple goal, to educate students. But there's always been more to it than that. When the world battled its neighbors, McAllister raised the United Nations flag. When others said no, McAllister said yes. When division and discrimination plagued this country, McAllister alumni and students organized and took action. We are not complacent. We are not apathetic. You, out there, have made a difference. In your neighborhood, in your town, in your city and beyond. So, for all the learners, for all the mentors, for all of us everywhere asking big questions, thank you. Thank you for not just asking why, but also what's next. Thank you for launching our mission into the world. Thank you for continuing to support that mission. Every day, for every student, whose aim is to lift up, to change, to discover, to reimagine. To make this a place where we all belong. A place where education is just the beginning. Aloha from Honolulu, Hawaii. I'm Julian Ako from the McAllister class of 1965. It is Max practice to begin its programs with a land acknowledgement. Let's take a moment to recognize the fact that McAllister is on Dakota land. This is the ancestral homeland of the Dakota people who are forcibly exiled from their land as a part of aggressive and persistent settler colonialism. Mac makes this acknowledgement to honor the Dakota people, their ancestors and descendants, as well as the land itself. As an indigenous native Hawaiian, I am on the land of the Kanaka Oivi, the descendants of the people who traveled across the Pacific Ocean in double-hauled canoes and were the first people of Hawaii. The history of my native people greatly mirrors that of the Dakota people whose land was also taken from them and who also found themselves marginalized in their homeland. McAllister recognizes that this land acknowledgement itself is not enough and only serves as a first step towards decolonization. Aloha. of a class of 2023 students, and I'm a member of the Parents Council. I use he and him pronouns. By way of introduction, I serve as Executive Vice President of Public Affairs at Universal Music Group, where I look after government relations and public policy for the world's leading music company. And I'm a proud 10-year veteran of US politics and policy, including both of President Clinton's campaigns and White House. Tonight, of course, we'll have some obvious changes in the format. Unfortunately, uh, we're not able to be physically together, all of us on campus, but the McAllister community is united together here this evening. And it is great to be in community with all of you. Thank you so much for joining us. Before we begin, permit me to share a few technical details with all of y'all. First, welcome to the Remo virtual event platform. Now, for those not as technically savvy as some of the kids, uh, have no fear. If you have any questions or technical difficulties, you can chat the Mac help staff directly from the platform or use your mobile phone and text the phone number 651-204-3910 for assistance to contact tech support directly. Now we've allocated plenty of time this evening both for questions that you might have shared during registration, as well as live questions that you might submit this evening using the Q&A box. Please do not submit questions anonymously. Also, you can upvote questions if there are certain ones that you'd really like to have asked of our panelists. Towards the end of the program, we'll also use the chat feature to share information and additional links with you. So please look for that. Now, to best enjoy this evening's uh, conversation, 
click the four arrows in the upper right corner to watch in full screen view. And finally, from the technical standpoint, please be aware today's program is being recorded and will be available online on the Big Questions webpage. Now, a note about the Big Questions series, which was launched to celebrate the McAllister Moment campaign for access and excellence. These events have really resonated with alumni and parents because they illustrate how wrestling with the big questions often leads to those breakthrough McAllister moments, connecting people with one another to faculty and to the work of the college. We're very pleased to be able to continue this series and convene tonight to answer the big question, what will the world look like on November 4th? Well, at the risk of ruining the evening suspense, we'll look into our crystal ball and reveal right here and now that the president next week will be Suzanne Rivera. Madam President, we're thrilled to welcome you to the McAllister community and your first Big Questions event. And we are elated to have your leadership, especially as we navigate everything that's happening in the world right now. As we think about tonight's topic, let's put aside the relatively narrow question then of the election's victors and ask more broadly, as global citizens, what steps can we take to repair fragile democracies and start talking to each other again? We are deeply polarized, but are we really that far apart on the political spectrum? Now, this isn't the only time in our history that we've been divided. What models do we have to unify the country? Is there a modern day equivalent of the space program around which the nation could rally across party lines? Is there a new centrist political party that could unite the middle? What about shifting to a new voting system such as proportional representation? These are difficult issues. And we're fortunate tonight that President Rivera will bring her bioethicist lens to the discussion as our host. And I now have the pleasure to introduce to you tonight's speakers, McAllister political science professor Adrian Christensen and Jane Zimmerman, class of 1984, who's the director of the International Studies Program at Davidson College. Professor Christensen and Jane Zimmerman's bios are located in the bottom left corner of the Remo floor. And in addition to the conversation, some of Professor Christensen's current students will be live tweeting during the program. You can follow them and join the conversation on Twitter at the hashtag HeyMac. President Rivera, I now turn the program over to you. Thank you so much, Eric. I'm pleased to be here this evening and I wanna welcome all of you who are with us, those on campus and those who are tuning in from around the world. Professor Christensen, Professor Zimmerman, it's an honor to have you participate in tonight's conversation, which I hope will help us all to grapple with the big questions we're facing right now. I know that you have lots of expertise and wisdom to share with our community, and so I'd like to just jump right in and start asking questions and see if we can get a spicy meatball of a conversation going here. <laughs> so Professor Christensen, let me start with you. Why is democracy important? Thank you for asking such an insignificant question to, <laughs> to start us off. Um, I would say that the, for me at least, the most important reason that I value liberal democracy is because I have the freedom to think and to speak, to protest, to appeal to the government to make changes, and I don't have to worry that I'm going to be jailed or tortured or killed for articulating those ideas. When it really comes down to the base reason, which is so highly personal to me, you know, I'd like to live and I'm egotistical enough to think that some of my ideas are worth articulating, um, that I would like to be able to do that and to do that safely and to be able to, to argue and to discuss those ideas and know that, that I will live through that experience. And of course, that is not the case all over the world and that is not the case prior to the development of liberal democracy either. So there's the very personal reason. The much broader reason is because I genuinely believe that people should have the right to choose their own governing system. And it's hard to choose how you will be governed, how 
um, you will have relations with your fellow citizens um, under autocracy. And so because democracy valorizes, valorizes the individual and protecting minority rights, I find that it's a, a system that, that I'm, I'm signed on for and I like. Well, that's great. I'd like to follow up a little bit and ask whether you think any of the events of the last six months have challenged notions that we have about our freedom to express our perspectives and to demonstrate peacefully. We've seen in the media clashes, for mm -hmm. example, between protesters and law enforcement. What does that make you think about the extent to which we fully enjoy the kinds of freedoms you're talking about? Well, I would say in the main, we do, at least in the United States, enjoy the vast majority of those freedoms. But you are exactly right, uh, particularly here in the Twin Cities. In the last six months, things have changed. Um, we had an uprising in May following the death of George Floyd, the hands of a police officer. And what I saw happen during that roughly four-day period um, was something close to anarchy here in the Twin Cities. Um, that people who were legally protesting were attacked um, by police. Um, plus there was the looting and the arson and the police and the fire department were not always coming to, to put out those fires or to, to deal with those challenges. Um, I think what happened this summer later in Portland, Oregon is a very sobering example of how some of the freedoms of expression um, have been curtailed in the United States. And of course, that's where um, unmarked, unidentified uh, law enforcement, we're not really, I think, perfectly sure who those individuals were, mm -hmm. but, wearing, but wearing military uniforms were sent in uh, into the streets of Portland to stop or to diminish the, the protests that were happening there and literally grabbed off the streets uh, drug into unmarked automobiles and uh, taken to jail. And so just those two examples alone, um, I think are illustrative of the kinds of challenges that we now face here in the United States. Um, so I don't want to be US centric. I mean, I'm perfectly aware that these kind of challenges and these kind of activities happen in countries around the world and that there are historical democracies um, that have, in other places of the world, who have also seen such behavior and uh, real threats to democracy mm -hmm. occurring. So it's not a U.S. problem. It's, it's a worldwide problem. Well, that's really helpful. Let's, let's bring Professor Zimmerman into this conversation. Do you think that some of the discord we're seeing today actually is a function of our particular version of democracy in the U.S., or do you see this as a worldwide problem? I see it as a worldwide problem. And what has really been a gut punch to me over these past months, but even just over the past four years has been how often I've seen this sort of situation play out elsewhere in my international career, particularly on the human rights front, particularly in democracy and justice, particularly on extrajudicial killings and human rights violations. But now it's really come home to roost. Uh, you know, it wasn't until we all got our smartphones with cameras and people started filming live the abuses against people of color that I think a lot of Americans really began to have the scales fall from their eyes. Uh, and what I witnessed in terms of George Floyd's murder and that so many others did is exactly what I would have put in a State Department human rights report as an extrajudicial killing. I've seen it all over the world. I had hoped I would never see it in the US mm -hmm. and never see it go unpunished or with impunity. And too often, you know, even going back uh, um, to my hometown of uh, St. Louis, I mean, we saw a police officer who killed Michael Brown mm -hmm. and never even had to face an indictment. So, and, and to go back to also uh, Adrian's point about Portland, the white vans, to me, that was incredibly chilling. I have interviewed over the years, you know, many people who have been abducted into white vans and the widows, the orphans, uh, the grieving families and parents of 
democracy, human rights defenders, lawyers, um, often healthcare workers who were simply speaking truth and truth to power and end up being abducted insidiously off of streets by unmarked security officials in white vans, uh, detained, unable to access lawyers or family. I never thought I would see that in the United States of America. Yeah, it is chilling. And, and in, the, in the run up to the election this week, I've been hearing a lot of people talking about concerns they have about the potential for additional violence and even, and even a sense of almost mystification that we could be worried about violence around our elections because in the past, one hallmark of the US version of democracy has for the most part been peaceful elections. Of course, there's been voter suppression and intimidation, but I think not the same kind of worry about outbreaks of violence that people are talking about this week. So I wonder, let's go back to you, Professor Zimmerman. How do you think the rest of the world is looking at our election season right now? How, what does our US election next week mean for the rest of the world? In fact, I attended an event uh, earlier today that focused very much on this same issue. Um, the rest of the world wants us back, but they're gonna hold us at an arm's length. Um, I think there are also some things that foreign governments have learned about uh, the US and how to work the system here. And the fact that, for instance, uh, we're so used to having a, a, a strong presidential system, a strong executive branch that usually leads the effort on diplomacy. And I think one thing that many foreign governments have learned is that presidents come and go, but members of Congress stay. Mm -hmm. So I've seen certainly foreign governments that have worked uh, Capitol Hill and members of Congress in a way that they didn't necessarily before. And they're, and they're beginning to realize that, yeah, a member of Congress may stay for decades, uh, but an administration lasts four to eight years. Uh, in terms of, I think the, the also are, you can't achieve and you can't answer big questions or meet the needs of our people without friends and allies. Mm -hmm. And our friends and allies want us back, but they want us to listen and not be dictating. Uh, I think probably, or, you know, my, my diplomatic career started during the Cold War. Uh, and then when, you know, the unipolar world where there was US dominance and it was often amazing how you, you could go in and tell a government, this is what the United States wants you to do, and they would just do it. Well, that disappeared about 17 years ago with the invasion of Iraq. Uh, and it has been different ever since then. Mm -hmm. So the rest of the world wants us back, particularly on the issue, the big issues like climate change, um, nuclear uh, uh, weapons and arms control, something that we've grossly neglected since the end of the Cold War. Um, they want us back into international trade. They want us to be good citizens. And we have to deal with issues like immigration, migration, uh, and uh, counterterrorism and security issues. At the same time, you people have embraced American ideals for so long, and people want us to live up to our ideals. That's so interesting because I wonder whether uh, people outside of the country think that we live up to our ideals better than people inside the country may think we live up to our own ideals. I wonder, uh, Professor Christensen, what do you think about the responsibility to vote as opposed to the right or the privilege to vote? Do you think, do you think voting should be required in the US? Yes, I do. I do. Um, and I know that goes against the notion of freedom and the ability to choose and decide that on our own. Uh, but I've, I've been in other countries where voting is an, an expectation, it's a requirement, and I think people, while may grouse about it, also feel like they have an investment in the outcome of those decisions. And so I think it's ought to be something we, we should consider. If I, could, if I could be indulged for just a moment, I want to tell you a story about my class uh, two weeks ago. We were talking about these very issues because the rise of authoritarianism uh, around the world was the subject of my argumentation class. And we began talking about alternatives. And I, and I said, if, if you have an opportunity following the election and that things just go haywire in the United States and you, we find ourselves in a position to decide what kind of governing system we want or what kinds of changes to the governing system that we have do you want, 
we had a conversation about that, and it was, it was eye-opening for me uh, on two levels. One is roughly half the students in that class were international students, mm. and they were extraordinarily articulate in laying out all the ways that the United States has failed to live, to live up to our ideals and our values. Moreover, uh, that conversation generated an extraordinary amount of interest. And something happened that day that I've never had in my entire academic career, which is that on a Friday afternoon at three o'clock, all but two of my students stayed for 75 minutes after class was over to continue discussing this very question. Mm -hmm. so, so in addition to thinking about whether or not voting ought to be uh, required in the United States, given the degree that we have failed to live up to our values, and given that we have not led in, in ways that I think we are always proud of in the world, I think it's a really opportune moment to stop and to think, where have we failed? And are there structural changes that we can make to address that? And that would include, it seems to me, a constitutional convention. Now, I know that a lot of people are very anxious about having a constitutional convention to reconsider uh, aspects of the Bill of Rights or of other elements of the Constitution. But it was designed for us to do that very thing. And I know that people are anxious about that for fear that certain things that we value might just fly out the window like freedom of the press, free speech, mm -hmm. um, so, so on. Um, but I want us to think about what the alternative is. So the press is full of stories these days about the possibility, and God let us hope it is a very, very thin possibility of a race war or an outright civil war in this United States. I suggest that us taking a very close and hard look at the, the ways that we might improve what we say we believe in and the steps we want to attain that is a far greater choice than to turn to physical violence and have people with guns patrolling election sites and, and so forth. So I think it's certainly worth considering deeply and thoughtfully. I think the idea of compulsory voting might seem oxymoronic in a sense. You know, if we have freedom, then theoretically that means we have freedom right. to not vote also. Um, but you, you raise an interesting question about what the alternatives would be to self-governance if people didn't right. participate in, and, and express their will and, and self-determination. I wonder maybe if we think about striving. You know, the whole notion of toward a more perfect union suggests yes. that you're always in a state of, right. of evolving your understanding of self-governance as opposed to reaching some ideal platonic state. And I, I just wonder where we are in that, in that process of striving right now. Professor Zimmerman, I have a question for you. As an ethicist, I think a lot about the principle of autonomy. And, and in considering this question of compulsory voting, I think um, honoring autonomy means respecting adults of sound mind and assuming that they should be allowed to express their will as they please. But occasionally in this country, we find ourselves arguing about things where one group of people wants to limit the choices of other people or the rights of other people. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of, of that principle of autonomy as we approach this election and how you think that, that we're, we're um, manifesting it in the way that we're approaching the challenges we're facing right now? It's an interesting question. It kind of leads me more into the domestic side of things and particularly the issues surrounding the latest um, Supreme Court appointee. Uh, I might digress a little bit, though, and kind of go back to the issue we were just discussing in terms of mandatory voting and, and uh, what these kind of, and the role of, the, of police and law enforcement. Because one thing I see is that um, I lived in Brazil shortly after dictatorship mm -hmm. when democracy began, and there there was mandatory voting. 
And all of a sudden people hated it. They thought voting was the worst thing ever, including people who had really suffered a lot during the dictatorship years. Uh, I do think that civic education is really important. I, I feel the same way about compulsory military service or compulsory public service. I don't think it should be compulsory. I think people tend to turn against it. You know, it's hard enough these days just to get people to put on a mask and stand six feet apart. Um, I would love to see uh, voting more accessible in terms of a full day off in order to engage civically. Uh, those kind of inducements. I'd love to see more investment in education so that people understand the role and responsibilities of government. To me, the natural political discourse in America is what is the role of government? How big should it be? Um, where does responsibility lie at the federal, regional, or state, or local level? But what also really concerns me too is, you know, one of the things we've really prided ourselves about as America and, and inspired other countries to emulate is the separate, is the civilian control of the military. Mm -hmm. And I think we still have that, but what's shocking and what I think you see in Minneapolis is more and more um, the uh, entry of, of politics into civil institutions, such as uh, law enforcement, where you have, you know, uh, uh, head of the police union who is blatantly partisan and inspires other law enforcement officers to be blatantly partisan. And then what's really been ignored, scary, you know, with, there's so much noise and static right now. But here's something I've seen overseas that's now happening in the US and shouldn't. And that is the recent, most recent executive order uh, mandating, uh, creating something called Schedule F. <laughs> Never has there been a more appropriate um, letter assigned to something. <laughs> Uh, that basically would turn policy jobs among civil servants and foreign service and others who deal in any kind of policy role in the federal government into political jobs. Mm -hmm. And that extends all the way into, for instance, do you really want the bioethicists who are working on human trials for a vaccine for COVID-19 to be political appointees? Or oh, we lost sound. I'm going to jump in because I think I think we're losing sound. What we've always had as a, you know a civil service, a military that have been nonpartisan, and how we're seeing that sift down into other institutions, including law enforcement. So we we lost sound for a little bit there, but let me let me try and jump in and recapture the thread. When the executive branch, uh, one of the aspects of the executive branch in the United States so far is that although we elect the president, there are many aspects of um, the executive branch which are made up of career employees. They're not political employees. And they serve a check and balance function in the sense that when a new president and administration comes in, there are lots of career people who have been there you know, from one administration to another and they sort of keep things going and in some ways, they protect against wild swings right. in either direction. I feel like as I read the newspaper each day lately, yeah. um, that a lot of the traditional checks and balances we used to rely on um, seem a little bit less reliable, seem a little bit more shaky, or perhaps are not serving those functions as well as we used to think they were. I wonder, Professor Christensen, if you think that that um, phenomenon in any way is undermining the faith that citizens have in our check and balance system. I'm remembering the time immediately after the 2016 election and lots of Americans uh, expressed deep anxiety about whether institutions might hold in the face of the new president's stated interests and goals of changing uh, certain policies, et cetera. And I would say that for the first several years, I was relieved at, at how strong those institutions were. And that notwithstanding efforts, <laughs> notwithstanding um, efforts to change practices or to change immigration practices or to allow certain people into the country or not. Fundamentally, the, the mechanisms of government 
seemed to me that they were working. But exactly the point that Jane was trying to make about the politicization of the bureaucratic level of government, what I have seen as, as time has gone on, what I've seen is um, one branch of government after the other continuously being politicized and the experts and the bureaucrats and the diplomats um, in essence being run out of government and so, so now we see those sort of political decisions as it regards uh, health care and responses to COVID uh, in response to uh, Supreme Court decisions. And I don't mean to suggest that somehow it was always pure and free of political uh, machinations before. That's, that's not what I'm trying to say. But it is very, very clear and transparent now that there is an effort to, to make political leaders be the deciders on a whole array of, of decisions that require expertise and authority and scholars, et cetera. Mm -hmm. and, and I find that worrisome. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about social inequality in the US and the extent to which our version of democracy either can serve as a remedy or in some ways allows inequality to persist. Mm -hmm. I wonder, and probably it does some of both, but we especially um, now I think are, for, for some people who previously were able to not think very much about the social inequality in this country, even they I think have been pulled into the conversation and understand that we have a serious problem with anti-black racism and with bigotry in general that manifests not only in terms of interpersonal interactions, but systems, systems of lending, systems of yes. unequal school funding, uh, systems of geographic segregation, et cetera. Right. And I wonder what role you think democracy can play in remedying or whether it is reinforcing those unequal systems. Well, I'm really interested to hear what Jane has to say about this question. Uh, but I will just say this much. I think people's antipathy to democracy has a great deal to do with the extent to which our systems have enhanced or have even had baked into them social inequality. And so we can see that in the Constitution. Uh, we can see that in Supreme Court rulings about African Americans being worth you know, two thirds of a person we can see that in terms of uh, women uh, not having the vote. I, I think about how African Americans, you know, were not able to vote until, with, until the passage of the uh, voter, the Voting Rights Act. Uh, I think about what has happened and continues to happen for Native Americans in this country. Um, and so it is this very question, I think, about social inequality that, that undermines, the lack of it is what I think undermines people's embrace of democracy because all they have to do is hold up and say, oh, you have these fine words and yet you don't live up to them. Mm -hmm. um, and so I believe it is possible that the beautiful language, the soaring goals, those, those values and ideals that are so eloquently stated in the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence and so on, I think they are worth preserving, but, but it has to come at, you might say, at the cost of actually fulfilling them. Mm -hmm. um, and when I say cost, I don't mean like a burdensome cost, it's just the, the challenge for us to set aside racist attitudes, et cetera. So I don't believe that democracy itself leads to inequality. I think it's our unwillingness or our inability to see, you know, to, to, that we have blinders on and that we don't recognize the full humanity of other people and therefore uh, extend the same rights and privileges that we want for ourselves to others. Jane, do you want to get in on this question too? 
Yeah, I completely agree. I think democracy is absolutely key. Is it flawed? Absolutely. Um, can we make it a more perfect union? Can we do better? Yes. And I think that if nothing else, these times now in the pandemic have really galvanized our society to try to address these kinds of issues and really laser focused people on them. We need health care. Uh, it's just mind boggling when you when you do engage with overseas audiences, they cannot wrap their heads around the fact that people are being do not, don't have access to health care. And that there's a possibility uh, within a couple of weeks that over 20 million Americans could lose their health care. Uh, you know, education. We talk, we've hear, heard a lot of, of discussion about socialism in the United States. Well, public education is socialism. Medicare, Medicaid is socialism. Social security is socialism. Do you really want to go without those things? Uh, again, it gets into this never ending discourse in the United States. And this is what to me is the proper realm of politics and political engagement is what should the role, responsibility, size and scope of government be? All that is within fair, fair bounds. Uh, people can agree to disagree. They can engage in passionate and thoughtful and intellectual uh, debates about that. And that's what I think a liberal arts education like McAllister really prepares you to do your entire life long. Um, but when we start getting into kind of this bullying and gaslighting, no, that is something completely different. When we're trying to deny other people the rights that we enjoy, when we don't recognize the effect of something such as redlining yeah. and how even after the passage of the Civil Rights Act that denied African-American communities and individuals the ability to accumulate wealth the way I have from home ownership as a first generation homeowner. Um, these are really critical issues and we do need to have a real reckoning in terms of the systemic racism and the other biases in our system that push other people up and keep other people down. You know, we don't need to be giving any more bailouts to corporations that use it for stock buybacks in order to inflate stock values and then cash out. You know, we have people who are looking at mass eviction and who are going hungry in food banks. I mean, we've basically outsourced poverty and made it a private uh, charitable uh, sector instead of actually looking at how we as a society come together and help one another. And I think that through the ballot box and through uh, civic engagement and democracy, we can do that. Thank you so much. I, I hate to cut this short, but I know that we want to leave time for Q&A with our audience who's dialed in and also time for interaction at the Remo tables at the end of the evening. So let me just thank Professor Christensen and Professor Zimmerman for a thought-provoking and lively discussion. And I hope those of you in the audience enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. I feel like we could keep going, but uh, I also wanna say I feel really inspired about all the ways our McAllister students and alumni can be working in their communities to help address mm -hmm. just exactly the kinds of problems that we've been talking about here and better achieve our goal of having the kind of democracy we all wanna see despite the challenges we've all outlined here tonight. So um, we're now going to have the Q&A portion of the evening for the next 20 minutes or so. We've been tracking questions as they've been coming in through Remo. Um, and you can continue to add questions using your Q&A function. So now let me welcome back Eric Berman, parent of a student in the class of 23, uh, who will moderate the Q&A portion of our evening. Eric? Thank you. Thank you, President Rivera. Uh, we've got some, uh, so many questions. These are great questions from uh, so many different folks. And, uh, and let, me, let me throw this uh, back out to the, to the panel. Um, this is a question from Lily Talmont, uh, class of 2024. Uh, and she asked what I think is, is probably on so many of our minds right now as uh, we've gone through such a difficult election season. Uh, and the questions over how the count will go. She asks, what effect could an extended election verdict have on foreign relations and the international economy? This sounds like a good one for Jane to tackle. Yes, it does. And I just wanted to say, hi, Lily. Thanks for your question. <laughs> I think that to a certain extent, uh, markets are already expecting it. And again, you know, you'll hear this, uh, particularly if you listen to, to uh, news, is that the stock market is not the economy and the economy is not the stock market. 
So will there be ups and downs? Yes. Some people profit very well from that kind of instability in the markets. But long term, um, our economy won't recover until we get the pandemic under control and we'll, until we can do the basic things of testing, tracing, and isolating as needed and taking the proper precautions and prevention. That's going to be key. So if you have leadership that comes in that acknowledges the science of the pandemic and we can start pursuing and taking actions according to the science, then the economy will come back in a very substantive way. And that is what our global partners need us to do. Um, they need American trade, investment. Um, that is absolutely key to, to at least getting not just the American economy back on track, but the global economy back on track. And again, you know, in terms of national security, a lot of, uh, I think, countries are going to be holding their breath to see how it shakes out. And again, as important as the White House is, so is the Senate. So are state legislatures uh, where um, district lines are drawn. Uh, what happens with the census? All these things are interlocking pieces. Um, it's interesting, even before, there's always been an adage that if you're a, if you're a diplomat, the hardest capital to work in the world is Washington, DC. Mm -hmm. uh, people have been trying to figure us out for decades and generations, mm -hmm. uh, ever since de Tocqueville. That's great. And I wonder, Adrian, do you want to chime in on what will happen if the outcome is uncertain, what we might expect in the days after the election, if there's not a clear and decisive verdict? Sure. I think we're going to see both tumult and chaos and a kind of, a kind of tentativeness. Uh, there was a, a story on the Daily today about how many Americans, including people who are hoping to, to vote for the Biden-Harris ticket, who are buying guns, hmm. who are buying guns because of their fears. I think that is a dreadful idea. I understand the in inclination to do that, but I think that is a dreadful idea to have thousands and thousands of people who are unfamiliar with handling a gun going and, and buying one in the uh, at, at a fear. Mm -hmm. So I think thoughtful people are going to sort of exist in a, in a, a liminal state of tentativeness mm -hmm. uh, because we're not going to have an answer or we're almost certainly not going to have an answer immediately. Um, and there will, be, there will be those people who will want to take advantage of that tentativeness and the anxieties and the desire for, you know, an outcome in some decisive way. Um, I'm anticipating uh, a quiet life for myself, uh, spending time with my students, and keeping a close eye on the news. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm just going to hope and pray that the worst responses that some folks have threatened um, that that's people being blowhards mm -hmm. and trying to stir fear, but really won't act on that. Well, I'll just say before we toss it back to Eric, I, I've, I've been really pleased with how many opportunities we're going to have on campus for our students, staff and faculty to right. process and to um, engage with one another to understand what the outcome is. There's a full menu of yep of events happening next week on campus to help us all understand what's happening and I'm looking forward to those. Eric, do you have another question to toss to us? We do, and, and this, is a, this is a bit of a follow-up. There's an extreme high interest in the, a, a, a scenario that I think we all hope wouldn't come to pass, but, but uh, the scenario is, and this comes from Kim Cole, who's class of 96. Uh, I would love to hear more about how speakers think things will play out if President Trump fails to concede and or peaceful transfer of power if he loses. Uh, and, and so that's a little bit, uh, a half step different from what we mm -hmm. were touching on before. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know, maybe it, maybe it makes sense, Professor Christensen, you were, you were addressing that and I thought it might be a good follow up in, in that particular scenario if the president fails to concede. Hi, Kim, thanks for your question. I'm glad you're with us tonight. Um, 
it, it is extraordinarily, uh, it is just an extraordinary violation of norms to have a president suggest that he won't relinquish power if he loses. And uh, the truth is, I don't know what's going to happen. Um, I don't think there will be a coup. I think the US military would not be engaged in such a thing. And particularly given the kind of pejorative language and, and, uh, and ways that the president has been reported to talk about military personnel, um, I think at this point that the military could probably be relied upon to escort the president out of the White House if it came to that. Um, but the truth is, it, that, that is what we call a, a constitutional crisis. I don't know legally what would happen and, and who would have to act and who would have to you know, uh, activate stricter measures like a, a, military, a military escort or something like that. I, I wish I knew. Jane, do you know the answer to that question? Yeah, I think it would be a real test of the resilience of our institutions, but it is pretty clearly laid out in the Constitution. And I also have, you know, great confidence in um, uh, our civil institutions and the military to go ahead and abide by the rule of law and what's in the Constitution. I'd say my deeper concerns about whether or not our um, civic institutions can withstand uh, the constant assault and violation of norms comes if we face four more years. Yeah. And I'm sorry to sound so partisan because I've worked for both Democrat and Republican administrations and leaders and admired people on both sides. But again, this is not normal. This is not normal politics. I also think it's extremely important that everybody abide by nonviolence yeah. on all sides. There is no excuse for violence whatsoever. There are all sorts of ways to protest, demonstrate, um, take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. But there's absolutely no excuse for anyone to become violent. Here, here. Amen. Um, one one question uh, that uh, that that has uh, arisen is comes from Paul Schendel, the class of 1967, uh, has to do with the question of social media, and obviously, so much of the uh, discussion has been uh, shaped. Uh, by social media, uh, some to the good, uh, some to the to the frightening, uh, both from within the country and, and outside the country. And, and Paul asks, in a world where social media is the source of most people's information, what can be done to reestablish an agreed upon set of facts upon which our public policy can be based? Mm, I think the sad thing is that there isn't an agreed set upon uh, set of facts. Um, that is that there are some people who will deny evidence, whether it's about climate change or public health and the virus. Uh, I think the real challenge is, you know, four years ago, we saw, we know that there was uh, Russian meddling in our uh, elections through social media. Uh, now we have, you know, reliable reporting that it comes from Russia, China, Iran. But most importantly, what you know, the questioner pointed out is that it's also coming from within the United States. And that, when you're looking at it through the viewpoint of our adversaries, that's golden. Because if they can turn us against one another, that's how you really weaken and tear apart a country and a society. And I think what is really alarming is that, yes, the United States by no means has had a virtuous history. Um, we have been involved in many proxy wars uh, as we kind of re-enter this great power competition. The, what's different now is it's not Russia, the U.S., and China with the, with the U.S. being dominant. Now the U.S. is the proxy. And in many respects, Russia, China, Iran are having a proxy war where the U.S. is the proxy, not an actor in it. And we, they've managed to be, and we have allowed ourselves to be turned against one another like this. I have a quick answer for you, but the solution is not quick. We have as a society to re-embrace public education and to fund it properly and to pay teachers what they, the, for the hard work and what they deserve. And we need to revalue 
um, civic education. So, like I said, that won't bring about a result to the social media kind of question that you're asking, but it is absolutely critical that more Americans use a broader set of tools in order to analyze the information that they get, to, to weigh that, and to be comfortable with arguing about it. Because we are never going to have agreement on you know, what are the facts and what do those facts mean and what are their implications. All we have is discourse and talk and argument about those. And so we need to be more comfortable with both arguing and analyzing, but also comfortable with losing. Um, because as one of, the, one of the readings in my class recently said in the very first line, is that democracy depends on the consent of the losers, right? Mm -hmm. So that our system holds if the people who don't win still will buy into that system and still acknowledge that. So, so public education, I think, is the single best but also uh, not a very quick way to respond to the quite meaningful challenge that you've articulated. Fantastic. I, I Professor, uh, uh, Carlton Goals of the class of 99 has a, has a, uh, a question for you that, that ties back to, I think, some of what you were referring to in, in what we have to study and how difficult it can be to pick out some of these trends. Uh, and, uh, and he asks, how would the 1990 version of Adrian Christensen have answered these questions about American democracy? Did you or did we miss something then? Could we have prevented this 20-year march towards fascism? Hi, Carlton. Lovely to hear you. And yes, I remember you taking my argumentation class years ago. The, 20, uh, the, the, the Adrian Christensen from 20 years ago, I think, would not have so thoroughly embraced the liberal democracy model that I would, like many Americans, have taken it for granted. Um, and yes, I think that I have done things that have undermined certain kinds of institutions, wearing my button that said question authority or challenging different kinds of institutions in society so that we have greater equality, but then also more tumult in society, whether that's uh, support for marriage equality, which I still think we ought to do. Uh, you know, challenging the he hegemony of certain kinds of religious views, etc. So, so I'm I'm in a position now where I can look back and see that, you know, what what I thought was absolutely the right thing to do, and that I still do see it as the right thing. I recognize more fully the kind of unexpected or negative consequences from some of those actions. So the, the older version of Adrian Christensen is a much quieter, cocky, and uh, assured person. I'm much more circumspect than I used to be. Professor Zimmerman, is there, is there something that we missed, do you think, over these last years? I do think that we have suffered from a uh, lack of investment in education and for all that we've tried to impose uh, with standards and we can get into that whole issue of no child left behind and common core. We have really kind of missed the forest for the trees. But I do think that getting back to civic education is really important. It starts at home. The other thing too is I hope people do feel empowered. I mean, if there's one thing I kind of feel now in my, you know, uh, international crone years is that I really do believe that great things are the result of small contributions from many different people. And I do think that every little bit we contribute, you know, maybe you're not up for phone banking and sometimes getting a blast from someone on the other end, but every little thing you do, including just going to your polling place and filling out your ballot and voting makes a difference. And that's what, you know, democracy is about, all these small little things. Being able to volunteer, giving your time, which is your most precious resource. Um, you may have more or less money. We all have the same amount of time, 24 hours in a day. So find ways that you can continue to get involved. And since this is a McAllister audience, I'm betting a lot of people are already involved. But the little things matter. Yeah, I'd like to throw in a pitch for listening to our fellows and our sister citizens. 
to genuinely, openly open ourselves to listen to their concerns and their attitudes and their beliefs, even if they are diametrically opposed to our own. I think that would be a really good place to start as well. And I'm going to push back on you a little bit there, Adrian. I think okay. it's also important to clap back because we have the holidays coming back and I have a mixed family in terms of, I mean, I have some relatives who make QAnon look mainstream. Mm -hmm. And when they speak, I respond. I listen, mm -hmm. but I respond. And mm -hmm. I do it civilly. I don't drop vulgar language because that undercuts your argument. But we're all gonna be facing some pretty tough times, whether on Zoom or around the table, um, with uh, the weeks ahead, with the holidays as well. Uh, and don't succumb to the bullying and the gaslighting. Listen, but speak your truths and make sure that your points of view are known equally well. And don't be shouted down and don't be afraid. And I think we have time maybe for just one last question and maybe President Rivera we can also ask you to jump in and what we can do to advance civility and decrease the odds of civil war, regardless of who wins the election. A question from Colette Smith, class of 74. Thank you, Colette. Of course, increasing civility is something that we're all thinking about a lot, not just at liberal arts colleges, but the free exchange of ideas is a cornerstone of a liberal arts education. The ability to do it in a way that is um, that is respectful um, and allows for different points of view is really important. I heard today in a meeting with our faculty the expression that it's important to be able to say hard truths without using hard words. Mm -hmm. And I, I've been reflecting on that all day today, how important that is. Now, I'm not talking, you know, like, like Jane, I don't think that we need to allow ourselves to be bullied or abused. No. And if someone says something that I, I think is disrespectful or rude or mean, I think they need to be called on that because freedom of speech doesn't mean freedom from consequences for what we say. It just means we won't be jailed for saying them, but it doesn't mean that we're all gonna like what someone no. has to say. And I think part of our job at a place like McAllister is to prepare people to be critical thinkers and effective communicators who can coexist along with others who have different points of view and disagree, but do it in a way that is not disagreeable. Right. Uh, that's really hard. It, it takes, it takes um, sort of principled practice to be able to get along with people who see the world differently than you see it. Doesn't mean you have to agree, but we are coexisting in an environment here on our campus that is sort of a microcosm of the wider world. And I feel like if we can do that well here, then we can send our students out into their communities, into their workplaces, into different countries, where they can be the kinds of global citizens who really are making things more just, more peaceful, more fair. But that's gotta start with us all being able to communicate with one another honestly. Thank you. I I think, I think probably we're getting to the point, unfortunately, where we need to wrap this portion mm -hmm. of the evening so we can get into our Remo tables and interact on a more intimate basis. I wanna thank all the speakers again uh, and the audience for their deep and in insightful questions that really added to our conversation tonight. I hope you all feel energized to go out and vote next week if yeah. you haven't already turned in your absentee mm -hmm. ballot. I'm looking forward to networking with all of you during the final portion of our evening tonight, and I'll be moving around to different tables in order to meet people. But before we start the networking, we will hear from just one more person because it is always heartwarming to hear a McAllister story and how McAllister has made an impact on someone's life. So let me now welcome Linda Kennedy, class of 1972, member of the alumni board and founder of LK Media, she will share her McAllister story with us. Thanks to our panelists. Thank you, President Rivera. Thank you very much. Uh, when I was at Mac, we would have said heavy man, heavy. And I think that's certainly uh, appropriate for uh, this evening's event. I am so totally inspired and I'm, I'm sure all of you are as well. Um, 
just listening to the conversation takes me back to my time at McAllister. When I got to Mac, uh, the nation was in the middle of social and political unrest, kind of like now. Um, students were so active when I got there. My consciousness was raised. I got active. I went to rallies. I went to speeches. Uh, under my bed, I had an army fatigue jacket, a dashiki, and a bra. I yelled, hell no, we won't go, black power, and women's rights now. And at the women's rallies, you were supposed to throw a bra into the fire. And I did that, but I was on scholarship, couldn't afford to buy a new bra, so I had to grab my bra before it actually burned. When we found out that Nixon lied and had sent troops into Cambodia, students hauled a bus bench into the middle of Grand Avenue and stopped traffic. We refused to go to class. Um, and here's the good part. It tells you a lot about Mac. Uh, instead of getting angry and demanding that we go to class, classes were canceled. Um, that was really an important moment for me. We were told to negotiate our grades with professors, and it was the first time I had ever negotiated uh, anything with an adult. Uh, we were told to go home and continue our political activism. We were supported for standing up and acting on our beliefs, and that's McAllister. We were taught how to think and then act. Mac taught us to uh, investigate and question, to always look for a better way. And a lot of us carried that uh, with us after Mac. We went out into the world and tried to make it better. There's a little McAllister in how we live. These are my McAllister moments, and I'm sure you all have your own. We're all part of the McAllister family. We need McAllister to thrive because these students can offer new solutions and build a stronger world for all of us. When you invest in the McAllister Fund, you invest in hope. The leadership we lead now, we need now, is inspired by a McAllister education. This is an unprecedented time. We are in the midst of double pandemics, medical and social. These things could cause one to lose all hope, but all we have is hope put into action. We have serious problems, and we need serious people to walk the talk. McAllister can be part of the solution. Our alumni have done great things, and with your help, they can continue to do so. The McAllister Fund helps students every day, giving students tools to, to, tax the, to tackle the complex problems that we are facing now. And McAllister remains committed to meeting the full financial need of every student admitted. Watch for ways uh, to uh, get engaged with McAllister. We'll send out a follow-up email about tonight's event. And of course, you can always go to the Mac Together webpage. We close today's Big Questions event with the McAllister tradition, the offering of the peace prayer by our current students. This is a beautiful illustration of the values that we hold dear. Thank you. เมื่อเฮาเริ่มออกเดินทางไปคนละสายขอให้พวกเฮาถือกล้อเลี้ยงด้วยมิตรภาพและการเฮียนหูที่แสนยาวนานขอให้เฮาใช้สิ่งเห